Doesn't it feel good to know that the goodness of God is running after you? Oh, absolutely. That is such, such an incredible gift. And one of the ways that God surrounds us with his goodness is by surrounding us with good people. Surrounding us with people that care about us and love us. And because, you know, because we're not designed to do life alone. We just simply are not. We're designed for that. We're designed for relationship. We're designed to live in community with each other. But the question is who are you surrounding yourself with? Who is your community? Who are you allowing into your life? Who do you allow to have a voice into your life? You see, because the people we allow to have influence in our li- have influence in our lives, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference in how we live our lives. If we are listening to people that are not influenced by the truths of God's word, we will be pulled in a negative direction. That's just the way it works. But likewise, if we're listening to those who know and the love and follow Jesus, we're going to be led in a similar direction. Because the voices are everywhere, right? There are voices clamoring for attention all over the place. And I don't have to tell you, but our country and our world is very fractured. It's very divided. There just seems to be, if you notice, there's a, there's a side to everything, right? There, there, there's the left, there's the right, there's everything in between. There's a lot of toxic voices out there clamoring for our attention. So how do you know, how do you know who to listen to? Even in the church, there are voices, there are a lot of different voices, some good, some not so bad. How do we know? How do we know who to listen to? Because if we are to successfully make life work, we must be listening to the right people. It's critical that we're listening to the right people if we want to make life work the way God intends. And God's word, the Bible has so much to say about this very issue and instructs us about the importance of surrounding ourselves with voices of truth. Proverbs is one of those books. If you have, if you have the Bible right in front of you, a literal one, not on your phone, it's right in the middle. If you ever want to just like dive into some serious wisdom that will change your life, just open it right in the middle. You're going to hit either Psalms or Proverbs. Good chance you're going to hit Proverbs. And it is so full of instruction on, on the importance of, of allowing wise words into us. Let me share a few of them. <clears throat> with you. And I'm going to pepper this message with Proverbs throughout the whole thing. But just to get us started, let me show you a few. Proverbs 19, verse 20. It says, get all the advice and instruction you can so you will be wise the rest of your life, surrounding yourself with people who can share with you good advice and instruction is so critically important. Proverbs 12, verse 5. The plans of the godly are just. The advice of the wicked is treacherous. Where do you get your advice from? The counsel from a godly person will be instrumental in helping you make life life work. Proverbs 19, verse 27. If you stop listening to instruction, my child, you will turn your back on knowledge. We cannot navigate this life alone. Surround yourself with people that can offer you sound instruction. One more, Proverbs 10, verse 17. People who accept discipline are on the pathway to life, but those who ignore correction go astray. Not listening to the right people will lead you down the wrong path every time. It is critical that we're listening to the right people. So let me share with you three reasons. Three reasons why it is so important that we surround ourselves and that we're listening to the right people. First off, the right people will speak truth to us. God, God will use the words of a friend God will use the words of a, of a family member or perhaps a pastor or a teacher to speak to us, to speak truth to us. We know that God speaks truth to us through his word. That's why he's given us uh, his word, the Bible. And, and that's why we corporately together are, are going through the gospels together. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I hope you're, you're entering into that and are part of this, this time of, of reading God's word together because there's so much power when a community of people all do something like that together. And God just pours into us. And I hope you're a part of that and it's never, never too late to start. Jump in and, and start reading with us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And God will speak truth to you. But God also uses people. <clears throat> God also uses people in our lives to speak truth. Sometimes that truth is encouraging. Other times it challenges us. 
It challenges us to make needed changes in our lives. But here's the deal. If you're surrounding yourself with the wrong people, you will not be hearing the right message. And that's the beauty of the church. That's the beauty of this, being in community with one another. While it is filled with broken people, it's filled with people that love Jesus and are seeking his truth. So let me show you an example. I want to show you an example from scripture. Uh, and we're going to spend... Uh, Let's spend our time tomorrow, this morning looking at some big chunks of God's word because they are so good, because they so beautifully illustrate these important truths. The first of which is there's an amazing story found in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's the story of Nathan confronting King David. And, and let me set it up before we get into it. Um, be, before this confrontation takes place with the king, we, we see David strolling atop his rooftop. Probably a beautiful sunny day like today, strolling around, kind of checking out his kingdom, surveying everything, just having a wonderful moment up on the roof, and his eyes are quickly drawn to his neighbor. Now, uh, it, this neighbor is described this way in 2 Samuel chapter 11, a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Come on, David. Come on. He saw that, and you know what he did? He had to know who she was. Who is that? I have to know who that is. So he quickly sends someone to find out, and he finds out who she is. He learns out that her name is Bathsheba, and she is the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah. Did you catch that? The wife, the wife of Uriah, instead of stopping right there, he sent his messengers to get her, and he slept with her. Come on, David. First mistake right there. Soon after that, she learns that she's pregnant. And so what does David do to cover up his sin? He knew he blew it. He knew he fell into sin. He saw what happened. So what does he do? He sins for her husband, Uriah, who happened to be fighting a war for King David. He's out fighting a war for, for the king. And so he calls Uriah back, all under the guise of, of, give, of, of, of Uriah giving him a report on how the war is, is going. And he tells Uriah, Uriah, you know what? Go home. Just go home, relax, be with your wife. And he refused to do it. Uriah wouldn't do it because being a soldier of integrity, he felt that it would be wrong. Knowing that all his comrades were out sleeping in tents and fighting a war, not home, not home with their families. And so instead, he decided to stay at the palace where David had summoned him. He was just going to sleep right there. So David tried again to convince him, please go home. Go home and be with your wife. Sleep with your wife. But once again, Uriah refused. David's plan to cover up his sin was not working. And so what does he do? He sends Uriah back. He sends him back out onto the battlefield and he sends a message to his commanding officer. I want you to put Uriah right on the front lines where all the action is because I know he's going to be killed. I know he'll be taken out of if, if he's there. And that's exactly what happened. Man, the mistakes just keep coming, right? David is messing up all over the place. And now knowing, knowing that he could no longer convince anyone that Bathsheba's baby was Uriah's, he sins for her once more and he marries her. He marries her and she gives birth to a son. Verse 27 in 2 Samuel 11 says, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. You think? <laughs> Do you think God was celebrating this? Very displeased. And through this entire scenario in David's life, it would be safe to assume that David had not surrounded himself with people who he would allow to speak truth into his life. Because if he had, maybe none of this would have happened if he had someone in his life that he trusted that would speak truth to him. But there was one person, there was one person though that he would listen to, and that was this prophet by the name of Nathan. And, and it, but even Nathan knew it was not going to be easy to get through this king. He, he was, he's not an easy one to, to, to talk to, to confront, and he knew that. But I want to read together how the conversation goes. This is so good. It's too good not to read. And once again, there is such value in just reading chunks of God's word together. So we're going to do that this morning. Look with me. It's on the screens, or if you have a Bible, you can turn to it. 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting at verse 1. It says, so the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. And he goes on to, to, to share the story. He says, there were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb that he had bought. 
He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. And then one day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal of his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. So David's hearing this and he's starting to fume. It's like, wow, who would do something so awful? And so it says, David was furious. And he said, as surely as the Lord lives, he vowed any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. Okay. Still not getting it. (laughs) He must repay four lambs to that poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you are that man. That's heavy. You, David. You are that man, the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife for your own. And this is what the Lord says. It continues, because of what you have done, I will, I will cause your household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in, all, in, in the sight of all of Israel. And then David confessed. He got it. He broke down. He confessed to Nathan, I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, and this is so beautiful, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. Goodness of God ran after David right there. And you won't die for your sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. Consequences. But yet still loved. Loved by God. Nathan spoke truth. Spoke truth into David's life. It was not easy. But ultimately, that truth was received, and it changed the course of his life. We all need a Nathan in our life. We all need someone in our life that can come to us and speak truth to us, no matter how hard it is for us to hear. We all need that person. We all need that Nathan, a true friend who's not afraid to speak truth when we need it. And that was Nathan for David. That's what he did for David. Because none of us are perfect. David wasn't perfect. You and I, we're not perfect. And left to our own devices, many of us will choose a destructive path. And yet a true friend will do all they can to prevent that from happening. Because a true friend is one who cares more about our character than our comfort. This is so important, folks. A true friend cares more about your character, about your heart condition, than your comfort, than the way you feel. They care more about the way we're living our lives than the way we feel. They're, and they're not afraid to say the hard things to us. Nathan was not afraid to say the hard things. It made David furious. He didn't enjoy that. He didn't like hearing it, but it changed him. It changed the direction of his life. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have a Nathan in your life? A friend, maybe a spouse, a trusted person? that can come and can call you out on your stuff because they love you and they care about you and they care about your character. Look at Proverbs 27, verses five and six. An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. If all your friends do is tell you about how great you are all the time, you might need to reevaluate your friends. Because we're not all that. We're not great all the time. A true friend that loves is not afraid to speak the truth. Proverbs 12, verse 15 says, Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Are you listening to the Nathans in your life? The hard truth that the Nathans in our lives speak to us comes from a place of wisdom. And we need these people, we need to listen to them because the right people, they speak truth and the right people will speak wisdom. 
will speak wisdom into our lives. And to have someone to do that in us, to have someone to speak wisdom into our life, folks, it is such a gift. What a true gift wisdom is. And to have someone that will give it to us and will share wisdom with us. Listen to the, just the dictionary definition of wisdom. It says, knowledge of what is true or right, and here, here's where it gets important, coupled with just judgment as to action. It's not just knowledge. Wisdom is not just knowledge. It's knowledge put into action. You see, the person who speaks wisdom doesn't just share knowledge with us. Their words move us into action. That's the difference. We can fill our heads with knowledge all day long, but wisdom moves us. It moves us into action. That's what moved David into action. That's what moved David into repenting for the sin that he had found himself in. It, they, it moves us into making the right choices in life. Here's another proverb for you, Proverbs 24.6. It says, so don't go to war without wise guidance. Victory depends on having many advisors. This is true in all of life, not just war. Victory in life depends on us having people who will speak wisdom, that will speak wisdom into our lives. Well, I want to pick back up with the, with the story of David, with this, this narrative that's unfolding in, in David's life. Uh, David and Bathsheba, they eventually have another son. They have another child together, and they gave the son the name of Solomon. Solomon grew to be a man that is considered the wisest man to ever live. And God used his wisdom. God used Solomon in the lives of so many people. And let me share with you an example, a fascinating story. King Solomon uh, eventually succeeded his father. Or yes, Solomon became King Solomon, succeeded David. And, and during his rule, there turns out to be a dispute that he had to, to deal with. A dispute between two women. These two women were living together, and each of them had a baby. And one night, one of the babies died during the night while these women were sleeping. And the woman whose baby died, she, what does she do? She sneaks over to the other one, and she takes the live baby, and she puts her dead baby with the other woman. And then they wake up in the morning, and she claims that, that it, it was the other woman's baby who had died and not hers. Well, any smart mother, come on, any smart mother, in, in which the thieving mom clearly was not, would know how to determine if it was their child or not. So naturally, the mother of the living baby knew that the other woman was lying. And so they took their dispute before the king. And I tell you what, Solomon threw down some serious wisdom right here. It is so amazing. We're going to read this together. Take a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, Then the king said, Let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim to have a living child. The living child is yours, and each says that the dead one belongs to the other. All right. Bring me a sword. Whoa, wait, what? Bring me a sword. Where's he going with this? So a sword was brought to the king. And, and then he said, cut the living child in two and give half to one woman and half to the other. And then the woman who was the real mother of the living child and one who loved him very much cried out, no, my Lord, give her the child. Just give her the child. Please, please do not kill him. But the other woman said, all right, he, he will be neither yours or mine. Divide him between us. Then the king stopped, put the sword down. <laughs> do not, do not kill the child, but give him to the woman who wants him to live, for she is his mother. And when all of Israel says, heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king, for they saw the wisdom, the wisdom God had given him for rendering justice. There is such power in wisdom. A wise friend can see right through our excuses. A wise friend can see the truth even when we cannot, when we're blind to the truth. If we have that person in our life, if we have that wise pr for that friend, they can see the truth even when we're not seeing it. A wise friend can quickly set the error of our ways straight. So who in your life is like that? Do you have that person do you have that person? Because here's the thing about surrounding yourself with wise people. You get wiser. <laughs> wisdom begets wisdom. Surround yourself with 
wise people and you will grow wise. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to grow wise? Who doesn't want to, to, to have this gift of wisdom? There's another proverb, Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and what? Become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. <laughs> walk with the wise and you too will become wise. It's so simple. That's the way it works. And yet if we decide, no, I don't, I don't need that. I don't need that in my life. I don't need to listen to people who think they're wise or tell me I need to change my ways. Okay, well, associate with fools and what happens? Get in trouble. Success in life comes with wisdom. How important is it? How important is wisdom? Look at it. Another proverb. This is so great. Look at this, this incredible description of wisdom. It says, joyful is the person who finds wisdom for the one who gains understanding. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. She offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. She will guide you down delightful paths. All her ways are satisfying. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold tightly. Who doesn't want that? I want some of that. I want to experience that. And we're talking about how to make life work. Did you catch the benefits of wisdom here in how to make life work? It says she offers you long life with your right hand. You want to make your life work. You want to experience long life. Take the gift of wisdom. It said wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. The right people will help you discover this incredible gift, the gift of making life work. And as we do that, something else happens. As we do that, you will find encouragement because the right people will speak encouragement to you. It comes with it. I cannot imagine not having people in my life to offer me encouragement when life gets tough. Truth and wisdom are critical in this life, but equally important is encouragement because life is tough and we need it. We need this in our lives. And I'm so thankful for the people God has brought into my life to encourage me because they've made such a, a radical difference in my life. I think of a pastor I had years ago who sat with me for hours as my first marriage was unraveling and his encouragement just breathed life into me. I think of other men who sat with me and encouraged me when I was despairing the loss of a job and I wondered how I would meet the needs of my family, how I'd provide for my family, and they were with me and they encouraged me. I think of the people in my life who believed in me when I didn't even believe in me. There's been plenty of times in my life where I, don't, I didn't believe in me. I didn't believe I had what it took to do whatever I was facing, but they did. And they spoke encouragement to me. How thankful I am for a wife who's always there to process my feelings with. Who loves and encourages me when I struggle through the challenges of life. There are times when life gets so tough and, and so confusing that we just, we just don't know what to do. And my heart breaks for those who, who go through these tough times and they don't have a community of people surrounding them. They don't have a community of others around them to offer encouragement. Because I believe one of the primary roles, the primary role of the church is this very thing, is to find encouragement. And yet I've heard so many times from people, yeah, you know, I love Jesus, but I don't need the church. Uh, I can be a Christian without the church. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people make statements like that. And to them, I always say, yeah, you can but you know what? You're going to be a miserable one. Yeah, you can be a Christian, but you're going to be a miserable one. Yeah, you can follow Jesus, but you're going to be a miserable follower of Jesus if you're not surrounding yourself with a community that can come along and encourage you, that can speak truth, that can speak wisdom, and that can encourage you. You will miss out on the joy of life. You will miss out on the joys of serving with your brothers and sisters and finding encouragement from them. We need each other. 
Look at this, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 and 25 says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promises. Yes, believe God, follow God, follow Jesus. But it continues, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good deeds and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but here it is, circle this word, encourage one another. Don't neglect being together, meet together, but encourage, encourage one another, especially now that the days of his return are drawing near. The times in which we live are tough. It doesn't take long to to, to figure that out. I don't need to tell you that, we all know that. And because of that, we must surround ourselves with encouraging people. This world is full of people that are ready to do the opposite, that are ready to discourage us. And they're not hard to find. These people aren't hard to find and that is why we're told not to neglect meeting together. Let's be together, let's be with people that we can find encouragement from because the world out there will beat you down but the world in here should build you up. The world out there is gonna do nothing but beat you down but you come into a place like this and we're gonna build you up. That is why we exist, that's why we are the church. But I want you to notice something in in this passage. It uses the word us three times. It also uses words like one another. It uses the word our. The point, why, why am I pointing this out? We all need to be encouragers. We all need one another. We all play a role in this. Much like wisdom, encouragement begets encouraging people. You offer encouragement to someone. You know what that person is going to do? They're going to go and offer encouragement to somebody else. That's the way it works. So allow God to use you to be the right person for others. Don't just sit there thinking, someone's got to come encourage me. I'm not, doing, I'm not moving until someone encourages me. You know what? Get up and go encourage someone else and watch what happens. That right there might change your life. We need to be around the right people, but we also need to be the right people. Paul, he wrote to uh, the Thessalonians a group of this church that he started in the city called Thessalonica about uh, the tough days that were coming. And he reminded them of this. He reminded them of the tough days and he said, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you're already doing. You're doing it. This is great, but don't stop. Keep doing it. Keep building each other up. Keep encouraging one another. Please never underestimate the power of another. Never underestimate the power of one another. You know, the New Testament alone contains nearly 59 one another statements because it's that important. Let me give you some examples. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another. Accept one another. Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Pray for each other. Love one another. All designed to bring encouragement. I think you get the idea, right? You, you, if you want to make life work, remember the power of another. Remember the power of each other, the power of the right people. Be around the right people and be the right people. Because the right people are going to speak truth to us. And as they do, you as well will be able to speak truth to other people in your life. And the right people will speak wisdom. They speak truth and the right people will speak wisdom to you. And wisdom begets wisdom. Receive wisdom, give wisdom. Power of another. We all play a role in this. And the right people will speak encouragement. Will speak encouragement to us. We all need it and we all need to dispense it. If you want to know how to make life work, surround yourself with these people. Surround yourself with people that are going to speak truth and wisdom and encouragement. And the cool thing is it spurs us on to do the same. We all get to participate in that and it changes all of us. I love the way that God works. Isn't that beautiful? All because his goodness is running after us. He loves us. What a gift that is. Would you join me in prayer? Let's just thank him for that. And let's commit to being this kind of people.
Father God, we thank you so much for the way that you love us. Lord, you, your goodness and your love is always pursuing us because you want to experience a great life. You want to see us make life work. And so, Lord, we thank you for the gift of people in our lives, gift, the gift of people who can come to us and they can speak truth to us. And, Lord, may we always have an openness to receive that truth, even when it's hard to hear. And, Lord, we thank you for the gift of people who can speak wisdom to us, that can move us into action, that can cause us to change our ways, to live a long and successful and good life for you. And, Lord, we are so grateful for the people that speak encouragement to us and over us. And, Lord, life is difficult. We all need it. Lord, may we be a people committed to imparting encouragement as well as truth and wisdom to everyone in our lives, to the people in our lives. Lord, we thank you for this place. We thank you for this, this beautiful community of people right here at Foothills. May we be known as a church, as a community of people that are committed to these, these, to these three, three things. Lord, thank you for loving us. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.